Okay, so hello, good afternoon, and welcome. Uh, the Center for Environmental Health in the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project welcome you all back to the third and final session uh, in this three-part series focusing on community and psychosocial impacts of energy extraction. This is Ellen Webb. I am with the Center for Environmental Health. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, the Center for Environmental Health, we are a national a not-for-profit organization with offices in Oakland, California, and New York City. As an organization, we focus on protecting communities so that we can all live in healthy environments. So, so far in this series, we have been hearing from a number of folks on a range of different issues. In our first session, we heard about community impacts and how the highly industrialized process of unconventional gas extraction in particular has led to changes in a disruption in communities, particularly changes to the social fabric and changes to econo economic changes and how things such as noise and traffic um, can all lead to stress, difficulty sleeping, and how, these, all, how all these things can exasperate physical outcomes um, and actually um, exasperate existing health problems. Uh, we heard about how communities have been reporting changes in social norms and there's been a perceived loss of cohesion where ongoing unconventional gas development has been taking place, especially when it comes to mental health. Last week, we heard from clinicians as they share their perspective on mental health impacts occurring at the community level. In that panel, social workers and clinicians discussed some of the problems that they saw with patients, with stress, anxiety, and mood, uh, and they talked about what they were seeing in their local impacted areas in their work. And they also talked about what they're being, what's being done to develop resources to help residents whose mental health effect has been, has been impacted. So the focus of today's session, we're gonna be hearing from researchers. So we're gonna be hearing the researcher's perspective. We're gonna be hearing about the community research and what, what, what sort of research is being done and what, what, how these researchers are using the data to be able to inform policy outcomes. Um, and part in this really, this final part, the goal is to be able to talk about what we mean by, so what, what, is, what, what is the research that's out there? So we know that although there is limited research um, that is out there on mental health associated with unconventional oil and gas development, there is evidence of those being affected by this issue as we've been hearing. And so widespread mental health impacts are consistent with emerging reports in peer reviewed literature. And many of these mental health impacts described in studies that are being done um, are consistent with multiple studies demonstrating the relationship between mental health outcomes and industrial releases of fossil fuel, which also document higher prevalence of depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders in communities exposed to releases of hazardous materials compared to those who are unexposed. So we will be really focusing on closing this last session with a brief discussion on the policy recommendations um, and, what, and how we can be able to use this data and take this information. So we have this information, but what can we now use this information? What can we do with it? All right, so with that, I'm now going to introduce our um, first speaker for today's session. It's a pleasure to have with us Miss Lydia Greiner. Lydia Greiner is a board-certified psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner who earned her bachelor's degree in nursing at the University of Pennsylvania and her master's degree in nursing at Fairfield University. She is currently a, PH can a doctor PH candidate at Boston University School of Public Health. She has worked in the field of public health for more than 15 years, primarily in the areas of mental health, aging, and environmental health. Her current research interest is in the relationship between mental health and the environment in communities impacted by unconventional oil and gas development. She worked as a consultant to the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project and collaborates with community environmental groups in California. She serves as adjunct lecturer faculty at Fairfield University, San Diego State University, and Cal State University, San Marcos, teaching psychiatric nursing and public health nursing. She maintains her practice as a psychiatric nurse practitioner as, as a volunteer at a student-run free clinic in San Diego. So today, Lydia is gonna be discussing uh, the, her research that she's, and she and her colleagues have been doing uh, con as they, con they conducted this research in southwestern Pennsylvania, an area of the United States um, that we've been hearing has been experiencing rapid growth in unconventional natural gas extraction. 
The purpose of um, what she's going to be talking about is their descriptive studies, um, which was to ex explore the relationships among mental health, physical health, and unconventional natural gas extraction activities. So with that, Lydia, I'm now going to make you the presenter. Great. Thank you, Ellen. I'm excited to participate in this webinar today. Um, the title of my presentation is Mental Health, Function, and Sense of Control, a Descriptive Study from One County in Southwestern Pennsylvania. I'd first like to begin by acknowledging my colleagues in this study. Dr. David Brown from Southwestern Pennsylvania EHP who conceptualized the study with me, Dr. Dale Glazer who did our statistical analysis, and Dr. Lenny Resick who I know um, you've heard from in the previous webinar. At the time of this study she was a professor at the School of Nursing at Duquesne University and she has made significant contributions to the interpretation of our findings. The study was as um, Ellen mentioned, conducted in southwestern Pennsylvania in the area marked by the Red Star. It's a part of the country with a long history of extraction of natural resources. And as you can see from the slide, it's in the middle of the very large Marcellus Shale deposit. The majority of the land in the area is farmland or forested, but underneath the rolling hills, the number of unconventional gas wells in this county is among the highest in the state. This map gives you an idea of the relative level of drilling activity. You can see the concentrated area within the red circle. But the map is really a flat representation and hides what it actually means to live in this region of our country. I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about that today. When Southwest PA Environmental Health Project opened its doors, community residents began contacting us to report concerns about their health. As I know you've heard from previous speakers in this webinar, communities impacted by unconventional natural gas development often experience significant changes, and the county where our study was conducted is no exception. Mostly rural communities of rolling hills and farmland seemingly changed overnight as the industry moved in alongside farms, homes, and schools. The landscape changed from this to this, and life for many residents changed as well. I think this is a great slide to um, demonstrate the impact of the industry in this um, part of the country. Um, the number one is is obviously is a unit. Number two is right above the impoundment for that unit. Number three is a second unit and number four is the brand new drilling location. Number five is location of a gas pipeline. And you can see on this image the proximity to farms and homes. As residents were evaluated by the nurse practitioner at EHP, she quickly noticed that along with their concerns about physical health, they were reporting depressed mood, anxiety, worry, irritability, stress. Overwhelmingly, they related their health concerns to the significant changes in their lives since the development of, or excuse me, introduction really of unconventional natural gas development in their communities. In an effort to better understand the relationship between mental health and unconventional natural gas development, in other words, what, what our nurse practitioner was seeing, we began with a review of the published literature. And as Alan mentioned, um, there were very few studies that specifically investigated the relationship between mental health and unconventional natural gas development. But a review of studies focused on large-scale industrial accidents related to petroleum industry consistently demonstrated higher rates of mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, and PTSD in those communities that were affected by events such as oil tanker spills and oil rig accidents when those communities were compared to similar communities without such experiences. And we had the anecdotal evidence from our nurse practitioner and the client reports that she was hearing. Since there was a lot we didn't know, we used a descriptive approach for our study. 
and the purpose of the study was to describe the mental health and function of residents living in one county with high levels of unconventional natural gas extraction. We had two study questions. What is the self-reported mental health and function of residents in communities with unconventional natural gas extraction activities? And number two, is an individual's sense of control related to mental health and function in residents of these communities. We added the second question based on the scientific literature that demonstrated a relationship between low sense of control and mental health in um, several communities that had experienced a petroleum related disaster. And um, because of the anecdotal evidence from our, psych our nurse practitioner who reported that residents felt that they could not change the situation in which they found themselves. Our study was carried out in a community health center. The clinic is located in a county that is designated as rural, one of 48 such counties in Pennsylvania. The county is racially and ethnically homogeneous with 94% of the residents identifying as white, non-Hispanic. Overall, the level of education is rather low. Only 10% of the residents in the county have a bachelor's degree or higher, and 43% have only a high school education or less. 11% live below federal poverty. Violent crime and property crime rates are well above the average for Pennsylvania and the nation in this county. So the residents are challenged on multiple levels. The study design is cross-sectional. We did one um, time measurement. We recruited all, basically all of the adults who presented to the community clinic, regardless of their reason for being there, were invited to participate. And we explained that it was a study about, quote, health in your county, end quote. We did not mention unconventional natural gas extraction at any point during recruitment or participation in the study. And recruitment took place on specific days between November 29th, 2012 and January 28th, 2013. And we had a response rate of about 55%. A total of 279 adults completed the survey instruments that uh, were part of the study. 40 of them lived outside of the identified county and therefore we excluded them from the analysis. So we had a total of 239 adults in our sample. To assess mental health and function in this study, we selected the SF36 rather than um, instruments that are specific to depression or anxiety. And we based this decision on input from our community partners, the um, administration and physicians in the clinic, because they indicated to us that mental illness was stigmatized in the clients that they served and that the community residents would be resistant to completing instruments that were clearly assessing mental health, such as a standard depression screening instrument. While there are items on the SF36 that specifically measure mood and anxiety, the focus of the instrument is overall health and function, and so we believed that this format would be more acceptable to the population. And in fact, we only had two people who looked at the survey and then opted not to fill it out. Um, everyone else who said they would were willing to fill it out did in fact complete it. The SF36 measures perceived emotional and physical health status and day-to-day -day function. And as the name implies, there are 36 items and they it actually measures eight domains of physical and mental health. But for this discussion, I'm only focusing on the four domains that assess mental health and function. And these are vitality, which that measure is derived from, or that score, I should say, is derived from questions about how full of life the person feels, um, how much energy they have, whether or not they feel tired. 
social function reflects responses to questions about how much one's emotional health has affected social relationships. Uh, the mental health score is based on responses to questions about anxiety and mood. Role emotional reflects how much the participant feels emotional problems have affected his or her ability to fill, fulfill the role in work and daily life. And then the mental component score, which is derived from the mental health measures, previous items, um, can be interpreted as if it were a standardized depression screening tool. We also asked um, our participants to complete the index of social control so that we could measure their sense of control over good and bad events in their life. Respondents are asked to um, indicate how strongly they or agree or disagree with statements such as, the really good things that happen to me are mostly luck, and I am responsible for my own successes. The highest possible score is a plus 16, indicating a strong sense of control, and the lowest is minus 16, which indicates a sense of helplessness and lack of control over things that happen to you. We collected some demographic characteristics, date of birth, sex, whether or not the person was a clinic client, the reason for their visit, and whether or not they were employed outside the home. We also obtained everyone's address, which allowed us to determine the density and proximity of wells around their homes. And before we discuss the results, I want to say that this um, study has not yet been peer-reviewed. It is in process. Our sample, however, was largely female. 74% of the respondents were women. Their ages ranged from 18 to 85 with an average age of 48. Um, only 43% of the participants reported that they worked outside of the home. One of the limitations of the sample, obviously, is that it was drawn from a clinic. But from this slide, you can see that um, almost 20% were actually there for a dental visit. 23% were there for a routine visit in the medical clinic. And a routine visit meant that they were there because they were getting blood work or they were there for a flu shot because it was still flu shot season. Um, they were not there because they had a, a physical complaint. 33% of the people who completed the survey were there uh, simply accompanying a client. They were either a family member or a friend of the client who'd come along for um, the visit. Only just under a quarter of the people were there because they had a physical complaint and were there because they were ill. And I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about the self-reported health of the participants. That's based on the response to a question Compared to others your age, how would you rate your health? It's um, this one of the questions on the SF36. And five responses are possible. Excellent, very good, good, fair, and poor. Fortunately, in Pennsylvania, this question is um, collected statewide and each year, and results are reported for each county. And because of that, we were able to see that uh, the 23% of our sample reporting their health as fair or poor is consistent with the countywide data that was reported for the same time period. So suggesting that our sample is as unhealthy um, as their counterparts in the rest of the county. Prior to conducting this study, we had observed that drilling and related activities are often take place in close proximity to homes and farms. And these observations were substantiated by our sample. The number of permitted facilities within five kilometers of each residence in which our participants lived ranged from 12 to 216. Of the 239 participants, 221 had at least one well or other facility within five kilometers of their home. 
this slide shows the average score for each of the mental health subscales that are measured with the SF36. The right-hand column shows the percent of participants with a score that indicates impairment. So the percentage with a low score, those lower scores indicate impairment. Those are scores that are less than 40. The median for the mean for the population is 50, and scores within um, five points of that. So from 45 to 55, they're considered average. Scores that are less than 40 indicate significantly impaired function for any of the subscales. The mental component score, the MCS, as you might remember, can be interpreted as if it were a depression screening instrument, like the PHQ-9, for example, which is used in many primary care settings. Most of us have probably filled one out at one time or another. For the MCS, a score of 42 or less is consistent with a positive screen for depression. In this sample, 31% had a score um, of less than or equal to 42, consistent with a positive screen. You would expect in this sample to see 19%. The index of social control was available on 195 of the respondents, and scores ranged from a minus 9 to a plus 14. Remember the range for that is minus 16 to plus 16. So we used multiple regression to look at the relationship between the individual characteristics that we had on each participant and their mental health and function as measured by the SF36. And what we're showing you here is only the coefficients that were significant. So you can see that um, individual sense of control is significantly related to each subscale in such a way that an increased sense of control is associated with higher or better scores on the SF36. This is actually true, just as an aside, for all the measures on the SF36, not just the mental health subscales, but also the physical health subscales as well. So our results suggest that a significant portion of the folks in this sample are having difficulty fulfilling their work and social roles related to their emotional health. The mental component scores are consistent with a positive screen for depression in 31 percent of the participants in this study, and a low sense of control is associated with lower scores on mental health measures in this sample. Our findings are consistent with um, several other studies. The association between sense of control and mental health and function is, in particular is consistent with the qualitative work that's done by um, Lenny Resick and her colleagues. I know that you heard a little bit about that study um, in the last webinar, but they found that women living in close proximity to drilling activity expressed feelings of powerlessness over their own health and the health of their families. Other studies have shown that a low sense of control is linked to mental health outcomes such as depression, stress, anxiety in um, groups as diverse as young adults, expected parents, and older adults. Additionally, limited research findings are out there that suggest that sense of control is not fixed and can be increased through cognitive interventions. There are several limitations of this study. Um, due to the cross-sectional nature of it, it's not possible for us to determine if current health status or sense of control, for that matter, are a result of exposure to unconventional natural gas extraction activities. This sample was a convenient sample of adults who presented to the clinic, thus generalizability is limited. It is possible that a sample drawn from a clinic is sicker than the general population. I have sicker in quotations. That's how I mean that. Although the similarity of the proportion of county residents and participants who reported their health as fair or poor suggests a similar level of healthiness. Other characteristics of our sample could influence the findings. 
the samples predominantly female and prevalence of several mental health problems including depression is higher in females and characteristics such as employment status, disability, education and marital status all of which influence rates of depression were not collected and should be in future studies. And lastly, a further limitation is the lack of variability in our sample. Only um, just over 7% of participants did not live within 5 kilometers of a well, compressor station, or processing plant. So future studies would need to include a larger group for comparison that did not live in such close proximity to industrial activity. In conclusion, um, we would like to suggest that interventions to increase sense of control be considered in communities where residents are experiencing intense natural gas extraction and also educate primary care providers and community residents about possible mental health outcomes. And to um, those ends, Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project has developed a handout specifically for primary care and mental health providers to alert them to the potential relationships between mental health and unconventional natural gas and oil development. And I believe that that was discussed in the previous webinar. And um, I invite you to um, make yourselves um, acquainted with that document. And Ellen, that is um, the end of my presentation for the moment. So with that, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. We have Miss Angela Angel. Angela is a health impact assessment practitioner and program manager of Mobile Worker Wellness with Habitat Health Impact Consulting based in Calgary, Alberta. She provides expertise to industry, government, and communities on how to maximize mobile workforce wellness and in turn boost worker morale, productivity, retention, safety, and overall worker and community well-being. Angela will be discussing the prevalence of depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders in communities and industry workers. So Angela, I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Angela Angel, as Ellen mentioned, and I'm a natural resource sociologist, and uh, I'm located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So in my home province of Alberta, um, particularly before the, before the economic downturn happened, it seemed that everyone had a brother, niece, nephew, cousin, aunt, ex-boyfriend or ex-wife, or much missed friend who works up in the city of Fort McMurray, where the Alberta oil sands are located. Mobile work appears within Alberta and across Canada to be changing the face and inner dynamics of many communities, families, and individuals. The mobile workforce population um, is significant. Uh, before the economic downturn, a uh, recent uh, internal government document um, stated that, that there was about 300 work camps within Alberta operating and, uh, and accommodating roughly 76,000 workers. So within my role as a, a health impact assessment practitioner, I conduct interviews um, quite often with medical officers of health, mental health and addictions counselors, public health managers, environmental health officers, and again and again within my consulting work, the mobile workforce comes up as a key driver of change. So in my presentation today, um, I'm first going to talk about uh, the catalyst or the entry point for my mobile work research and underscore the importance of looking at the mobile workforce population. So those men and women that live in work camps, live and work away from home. Second, I'm going to explore um, through the qualitative research that I've conducted, five mobile worker well-being themes and five features of the mobile work environment that I identified 
um, which influence mobile worker well-being. And third, I'm going to um, quickly introduce a tool that we are currently developing to assess mobile worker well-being as a way to enhance living and working conditions and as a way to ensure happier, healthier, safer, and more productive workers. So to begin, I'm going to um, talk about the catalyst for my mobile work research. So um, I've been a researcher with the, uh, the provincial government here in Alberta as well as with the Canadian government. And during my time as a researcher, I was in a resource boom town um, uh, looking at the roots of substance abuse, why there was so much substance abuse in this particular resource boom town of Hinton, Alberta. And I recall um, coming with this uh, vivid quote by one of the, um, the family and community support services directors that I interviewed. And she talked about how the mobile workforce, um, we don't know them. We don't know what they need. We don't know what they want. And um, it was very clear that um, this quote succinctly illustrated the lack of understanding and the disconnect we have with respect to mobile workforce populations. That is, we know that these populations tend to place stress on local communities, but we rarely investigate what they need to improve conditions or potentially improve attitudes and behaviors and how this relationship between mobile workforce communities and host communities can be best approached or managed. So if we get back to um, the resource boomtown literature of the 1970s and onwards, um, we come across uh, a boomtown researcher by the name of William Freudenberg, and he was very well known and well respected um, rural sociologist in the US. And he made this quote um, of the mobile workforce. He said, you know, given the importance of this group, it is somewhat surprising to discover how little solid information about construction workers can be found and that there's this frequent assumption about construction workers and other temporary newcomers is that they're somehow single-handedly responsible for the broad range of problems encountered in boomtowns. And William Freudenberg goes on to state that while the assumption may be consistent with a number of stereotypes, it does not appear to be supported by anything more than circumstantial evidence. Unmuted. So perceptions of this shadow population have, um, over the past uh, three decades, remained relatively static. Um, here is a quote from a book written by um, a man in Alberta. And again, he's portraying the mobile workforce as, you know, most of them are exhausted. Many are drugged on amphetamines or pissed to the gills. Um, and, you know, when they go home on shift change on the busy highway, a lot of people won't drive on those days. So again, this, this stereotype of um, this deviant population has been perpetuated for, for the last three or four decades. So mobile workers, who are they? Well, I often argue that mobile workers are not who we think they are. On one hand, these men have been systematically constructed as deviants, as rig pigs, as men with too much money who are escalating the drug trade and implicated in the increase in substance abuse, impaired driving, traffic accidents, prostitution, STIs, violence, and crime. So we often perceive them as outsiders, as the vector bearing ill things, as a nuisance. We even talk about worker-proofing host communities. But who are they really? Um, in a recent study within um, the Fort McMurray area or the Alberta oil sands area, um, we found that mobile workers are not who they not who we think they are. So um, increasingly mobile workforce is being made up of females. Um, in, in Alberta, in the northeast corner of our province, 83% were males, 17% were females, and this number is continually increasing. And while the mobile workforce is often thought to be comprised of uneducated young males, in Alberta, the mobile workforce is actually older than we thought with most of them being over the age of 35. Unmuted. With the majority being over 45. And uh, despite our preconceptions that they're mostly single, um, the, the census of the mobile workforce in 2012 in Alberta found that 
more than 50% are common law or married um, within this population. So, so they're actually, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we, we perceive and, and they contrast to, to what the reality is. So in um, 2014, I wrote a white paper um, on the mobile workforce um, for Target Logistics, which is a um, mobile workforce logistics firm. And I did some uh, primary qualitative research in camps located near Williston, North Dakota. And I also brought in my own research that I conducted in the Alberta oil sands. And within this paper, I argue that stereotyping oil field workers can have harmful consequences. Um, this roughneck stereotype does not account for the vast and the varied lived experiences, the positive values, the family-based motivations, and the productive goals of a large majority of mobile workers. Nor does it account for the challenges that these workers may face in living and working away from home. This dismissive stereotype also does not recognize the critical role these workers play in the energy extraction and processing activities of North America. In fact, I argue that perpetuating the stereotype um, of mobile workers as specifically strictly deviant can harm worker and community well-being in two key ways. Number one, um, based on the social reaction theory, if we perceive or treat a social group a certain way, they may tend to act according to that identity. For example, deviant. Um, the second way in which um, it can harm community and worker well-being is in perpetuating stereotypes that mobile workers are deviant, we tend to see, to, we tend to fail to see the vulnerabilities of social groups, and we tend to fail to investigate deeper roots of social issues such as substance abuse. So, men in camp, who cares? I've often heard people say, say that, you know, these workers that are predominantly men, they make loads of money, so who cares about their well-being? The general public discourse around men in camp is that any negative attitudes, behaviors, or practices are just tied along with their characters and their culture. Or is it? Or does, something, does it have something to do with the work camps and their environment? So um, recently, within Canada and within Alberta, um, there's been an economic downturn. But unfortunately, within Alberta, you know, we're not doing a great job of documenting statistics of suicide rates or mental health issues, specifically amongst mobile workers or within workers in the energy sector as a whole. But I do know that, anecdotally, at an industry forum that I was invited to speak at in the fall of 2014, um, labor relations people were reporting that people are dying by suicide in work camps in northern Alberta. And while there's no hard and fast numbers to present today, uh, recent statistics um, from Alberta Health Services in, in our home province um, do indicate that suicide rates in Alberta as a whole have increased 30% since last year. And local demand for counseling services, such as in the Calgary Distress Centre, um, the demand for services has increased by 80%. So, so these are numbers, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to attempt to explain what might be going on behind these numbers? That is, to shed light on the lived experience. So my research um, has been conducted um, a while ago, but in 2009. And uh, interestingly, it was uh, a period where um, there was a, a huge economic boom, and the boom was just turning to a bust. So quite similar to the present economic context today. My research involved in-depth qualitative interviews with male, specifically male mobile workers, 16 in total, 11 professionals in the helping profession, such as addiction counselors, victim service coordinators, crisis prevention workers, and seven mobile work experts, including um, trades instructors, other consultants, social planners, and labor union representatives. So I interviewed workers in various camp settings, small scale, large scale, executive camps, and my aim of the research was to give voice to the shadow population. So in a nutshell, um, I identified that amongst the shadow population, there appears to be two groups emerging. And that is the, the thrivers versus the strugglers. And this quote um, sort of 
summarizes the thrivers and the strugglers. The thrivers know why they're up there. They have, um, you know, goals. Um, they're working hard towards those goals. And then there's the strugglers. Um, and the strugglers are, you know, people who are really struggling with issues such as money, relationships, and substance abuse. Many are working away from home to try and escape their problems. Um, so this thrivers and strugglers, um, I see them along sort of a spectrum. And individuals can move along the spectrum depending on what's happening in their lives. So um, what I'm going to describe now is the psychosocial factors that contribute to um, the issues or people being thrivers, people being strugglers within within mobile work camp settings. So I'm going to look at some quality um, mobile worker well-being themes. So there's a um, there's a number of themes here, and um, I'm attempting to sort of give them life by, by using quotes and sort of describing um, the general ideas that have emerged behind these quotes. So the mobile worker well-being themes that I've identified, theme one, this idea of workers living three lives. Um, and this theme um, is similar to other research that's been conducted by mobile work camp. Um, other research has identified, you know, workers often feel like they're living two lives. There's the, the work life um, in the work camp, and then there's the home life when they go back to home with their families or their friends. And my research um, really wants to underscore that there's, there's actually this third dimension, and that's sort of the in-between state where workers are trying to um, adjust from their work self to their home self. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more complex than that. So my research revealed that making a shift um, change into mobile work um, without any prior experience in mobile work or military setting, it's not easy. So in the beginning, um, the men I interviewed found that, um, you know, going from, from work for two weeks and then going home for two weeks, there was an initial shock and adjustment period for these individuals as they arrived home and spent the first few nights, um, you know, back at home. Um, and, and they talked about how, you know, this was creating them a lot of anxiety, this, this shift from, from work to home. Um, and I also, I also point out that, you know, within the research that's been done, there's um, the syndrome called the intermittent husband syndrome, which is talking about what, what spouses feel when, when predominantly their husbands come home and, and things, um, you know, things are confusing, um, you know, perhaps the wives have raised their children in certain ways and the husband comes home and disrupts that sort of flow of life. But, you know, there has been no research looking at um, what husbands go through, the disruption of life for husbands. So I really wanted to, to shed light on that as well. Um, so this idea of, of living three lives and, and the transition and the anxiety that these men experience. Um, a second theme is uh, talking about, um, you know, the the opportunity, but also the danger of making a lot of money. Um, so the mobile worker um, I interviewed uh, for, he's been doing mobile work for the past 25 years, talked about how, you know, money um, really was, was um, a good thing, but also was severely disruptive as well if, if people didn't have, um, you know, intrinsic goals or purpose goals. So a lot of, um, men, mobile workers within the resource sector, um, this money became sort of an addiction and there became um, relatedly a consumer addiction. Um, the purchase of toys, um, skidoos, big trucks, quads, and how these men were um, forced to work long, hard hours because they had to um, keep up with their spending or their debt. So, um, and one quote um, from a addictions counselor talked about how, um, up in, in mobile workforce camps in Fort McMurray, there was the me, myself, and I culture. So, so because there was a focus on money um, and buying things, um, it became a very selfish endeavor um, oftentimes. Um, a third theme that, uh, that sort of came out of my qualitative research was this idea that work camps felt like an institution. They felt like a jail. Only you're getting paid. Um, so, um, there's a quote um, by one of the mobile workers, and he says, 
everything in your life is taken from you. Your family is taken from you. Your friends are taken from you. Your freedom is taken from you. It's like living in jail, only you're getting paid. You go from room to room, from lunch trailer to bus, to work for 12 hours and back to your room. Um, so that was sort of a, a theme that was echoed amongst a lot of mobile workers. Um, the, the lack of freedom and um, ability to do their hobbies, get outside, um, you know, have sort of that, that dimension of normal life. Um, go to a hockey game, go to a concert, um, talk about the news to your friends and your family. A third theme that came out um, from the research, sorry, the fourth theme was the oil comes first. And this appeared to speak to the larger question of, you know, how does working within a mega scale industrial project during an oil boom translate at the human level? So many mobile workers alluded to this lack of um, felt value or respect by industry employers during a boom. Many workers expressed that they felt pressure to work long hours, maximize production, but they did not feel um, valued. They felt like a number. They felt like a cog in a machine. Um, and, you know, one worker said, you know, it's like the oil comes first. And um, it seems like um, none of the social issues were sort of coming to the surface and, and being talked about. It was always um, a focus on profits um, and making money. And the third or sorry, the fifth theme here um, was this idea of um, interpersonal deprivation and the shaking of the pop bottle. So um, interpersonal deprivation, one of the main challenges for workers was um, this lack of connection from, from people at home, um, from their friends and their family. One counselor described men um, as exhausted, deprived of sleep, intimacy, and con connection. Um, and they compared the internalization of these feelings to the shaking of a pop bottle. And um, she said, you know, it's only a matter of time before the lid is lifted and everything around you is going to be affected. Um, so the shaking of the pop bottle phenomenon is a theme that describes sort of the worst case scenario for those strugglers in the mobile work setting. Um, you know, these people, um, a lot of the guys, counselors talked about, they're hurting. Um, you can see it in their eyes. They're exhausted. And, um, you know, they snap. So, so this was sort of connected to um, many of the, the unhealthy coping mechanisms as well that we saw in Fort McMurray within the camp, um, the use of drugs, you know, the use of driving extremely fast on highways, dangerous driving, reckless driving, um, bar fights, um, fights within the work camp, a lot of um, altercations happening within the hallways amongst workers. Um, so, so those are some of the, a look at some of the themes that, um, that I discovered. And, and to just sort of highlight quickly, the key factors that affect well-being within the camp, um, some of the key factors that I identified was this idea of high demand and low control work schedules. Um, so there's rigid work schedules and a lot of mobility, but not a lot of control over, over their lives um, with these men. Um, a second one, institutional-like settings of work camps, men feeling like they're in jail, like there's all of these rules imposed upon them, um, and, and hardly any freedom to sort of do what really nurtures, nurtures <coughs> them. Um, the high pay was also identified um, as, as a potential issue of, you know, getting addicted, consumer, high consumerism, um, and the emphasis on oil production, the oil comes first again, men, um, workers feeling alienated. And then, of course, these masculine work cultures where um, they're perpetuating this belief um, and this behavior that, you know, big boys don't cry um, and, and they bottle it up um, until, you know, eventually uh, they shake the pop bottle so hard um, it explodes. So men in camp, I argue that it is imperative that we care. Um, and one of the um, sort of policy implications or suggestions that I have um, and that we have been working on at Habitat Health Impact Assessment, where I work as a consultant, is the idea of a mobile worker well-being assessment tool. So I strongly um, argue that we do need to start to include the mobile workforce populations within health impact assessment, social impact assessments that we do, because many of these um, worker communities um, rival the size of the host communities that they are beside. Um, so we need to start systematically looking at these spaces and um, working to improve the social and the environmental um, factors of work camps. So 
So thank you very much. Um, a lot of um, what this presentation is based on. Dr. David Casagrande. Dr. Casagrande is an Associate Professor of Anthropology and Research Coordinator for the Environmental Initiative at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He has studied how humans derive benefits from natural environments in Mexico, Venezuela, and the United States with an emphasis on policy and planning. David has worked as a policy analyst in state and local government for 10 years. He currently leads an interdisciplinary team studying the impacts of hydraulic fracturing on human quality of life in Pennsylvania. David has his bachelor's in science and geography from Southern Connecticut State University and a master's in science in ecology and policy from Yale University. And he has his PhD in ecological anthropology from the University of Georgia. David today is gonna to be talking about policy implications of unconventional shale gas development and impacts on quality of life. He will discuss uh, results from interviews, I, I believe he did during his research and focus groups. Um, and survey research and how unconventional shale gas development uh, is impacting life satisfaction and perceived stress in Pennsylvania's northern tier. So welcome, David. It's great to have you with us. I'm now going to go ahead and uh, turn this over to you. Thing went a little bit wrong just then, but um, so uh, this is a, a, a project that's a, a team effort, and uh, one of the approaches that uh, we try to use uh, when we're thinking of muted. Um, developing research that could possibly impact policy is to include uh, a lot of different people so that is more likely to happen. So you'll notice that uh, in addition to a psychologist and a sociologist, uh, we have a couple of economics um, people on, on our team and also a, a planner and so on and so forth. So the area that we've done our research is uh, actually uh, in northeastern Pennsylvania and so that's a little bit different or it's, I should say it's at the uh, opposite end of the state. Uh, from what you just heard um, from Lydia, uh, and this is in the, what's called the northern tier of Pennsylvania. So what I'd like to do today um, is first uh, take about 10 or 15 minutes to talk about the research uh, and then spend all about the last 10 minutes uh, talking about policy uh, in general and some specifics of this webinar. So we are interested in uh, looking at uh, evaluating Pennsylvania's shale gas policy uh, in addition to looking at traditional economic terms, kind of evaluating it on how well it actually impacts uh, people's quality of life, for better or worse. And we uh, were looking at psychological stress, uh, life satisfaction, in addition to uh, economic costs and benefits at the household level. And so that's sort of the background for this research. Um, and specific questions uh, we we're looking at are what are the sources of psychological stress uh, amongst our participants? Um, how do economic development and stress interact to impact satisfaction, uh, life satisfaction, and why do, and this is a, the real uh, policy question here, why do some communities experience more benefits than others? And as you travel throughout the northern tier, you can really get a sense of how uh, some communities tend to accrue more benefits than others. So we're interested in looking at uh, what socioeconomic assets uh, individual communities uh, might have that allow them uh, to capture benefits uh, and uh, things like proximity to highways, uh, your level of education and so on are all things that allow your community to uh, capture more of the benefits of uh, rapid economic development like we're seeing uh, in the northern tier. The other thing we were interested in looking at was uh, the actual impacts of the drilling activities themselves uh, and uh, so we have a, a geographic information systems component to the research uh, that will actually correlate data from the households uh, to the landscapes around them. And our ultimate goal is to develop a statistical model in which we combine all of these things uh, to try to see how uh, we can predict life satisfaction uh, based on all of the different variables. So <clears throat> this is the research flow. Uh, and uh, I'm sort of to the left of the screen with my expertise uh, uh, leading up the uh, F and the focus groups, interviews, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, some of the other team are working on the GIS aspects uh, and so on and so forth. So today I'm just going to talk about um, the ethnography, uh, the interviews, the qualitative data, and then the structured uh, interview uh, and the qualitative, I'm sorry, the quantitative uh, analysis. But we have not yet, I should point out, uh, we really just 
finished or started analyzing the data this week. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of hot off the press. But we have not done the structural equation model yet. Uh, we're starting only now to uh, analyze some of the survey data. So <clears throat> we're looking at five counties uh, in the northern tier uh, that are listed here. Um, we did a focus group in uh, Wyoming and a focus group in, in um, Lycoming County. Uh, and those were, one group was all people who leased their property uh, for gas exploration and uh, the other one was people who mostly did not lease uh, their property. Uh, we've done so far about 31 in-depth interviews uh, with landowners, uh, planners, township supervisors, business owners. Uh, I even uh, interviewed the district attorney uh, in one county and so we're really trying to get as broad a uh, perspective as possible on why uh, what the sources of stress could be and why some of these communities tend to capture more benefits uh, than others. In the uh, focus groups and interviews we probed uh, for stress and quality of life issues. Uh, everything was digitally recorded, uh, transcribed and then we used in vivo uh, to code them and we used the codes uh, to actually create the wording in the structured survey. <clears throat> so we have um, questions about quality of life. We asked people to rate how well they agree with the statement about how development has impacted different aspects of their quality of life. Uh, that's part of the survey. And then we also included this uh, life satisfaction scale um, that's uh, pretty uh, well used out there in the literature. And uh, Cohen et al's perceived stress scale, we use the 10 point version of this stress scale. Um, so those are also in uh, the survey. Um, <clears throat> we received about 656 uh, survey responses uh, from uh, people in the five counties. Uh, and the other thing that we did that I think is, it, it cuts back to something that uh, Simona said in, in the first webinar, uh, was this need to really understand uh, what's happening at the local level uh, and how power and control, social control are distributed or not. Uh, and so one of the things we've been doing is uh, uh, participating in a local permit hearings in a, in a specific township doing a, a very in-depth uh, participant observation in just one township in Lycoming County. Uh, and then you might have noticed on the first slide there was a, a professor of journalism and communication and, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about what uh, she found um, doing content analysis of, of media messaging from the industry and how this in, it sort of integrates with uh, uh, psychological stress. So the, for those who have done research that are presented in this webinar, there's nothing on this slide uh, that would uh, surprise you. Um, this is what we're all sort of finding. Uh, if uh, I went to and uh, heard a paper uh, by um, Kathy Brazier, who's the sociologist at Penn State, and she showed a slide at a conference that looked almost identical to the one I'm showing you now. Um, so these are, you know, the things that people are talking about. These are sources of stress, uh, the noise, um, uh, the vibration when they're doing the drilling, some houses will vibrate, foundations can crack, so on and so forth. Traffic and accidents is probably one of the most uh, commonly cited uh, problems. Um, inc increased uh, cost of living uh, is, is quite uh, uh, an impact, as I'll show you from the survey uh, in just a second. Um, and this fear of health impacts is something that obviously affects uh, people's stress levels. Um, but social conflict is what we were very interested in because that just seemed to be like even getting people to do an interview um, was often controversial because people just they, they're sort of self-censoring. They don't want to talk about this because they're so burned out arguing with their friends and their families and neighbors about whether you're pro-gas or anti-gas and so on and so forth. And then clearly in the focus groups, um, and I should point out uh, that unlike the previous speaker, um, we didn't go into this looking for loss of control as uh, one of the, the variables. This kind of emerged uh, out of the focus groups. In particular, the focus group um, that had leased their property, they did not understand uh, that they were turning their property over to these companies and would have really didn't have wouldn't have much control over where the well was going to be sited, uh, where the pipelines were going to go. Uh, and even so, that even though they were uh, proponents of the gas industry and were eager to to, to participate, um, they didn't quite understand how much of the control of the property they would lose. And what's interesting here, and this is something I, I want to come back to later, uh, is that most of these people were of a political ideology that they were quite opposed to 
uh, any kind of county zoning or local zoning and ordinances. Uh, but now, and that might have worked fine when it was an agricultural landscape, but now that you have this industrial landscape imposed, um, they were, uh, a lot of them were actually actively uh, fighting to try to get some sort of zoning uh, and ordinances in, uh, in their local communities. And so this is one way um, to sort of restore a sense of control um, as a result of all of these impacts. So <clears throat> very briefly, these are just some of the highlights from the survey. Um, we, one of the things we did in the survey, uh, we asked um, whether or not somebody benefited uh, by either leasing their land, working for the company, uh, a company directly, or working in, a, in an industry that directly supports um, the, the gas development. And so the economic beneficiaries are the people that would have answered yes to any of those three questions, and non-economic beneficiaries are pretty much people that uh, are not benefiting any way from the development financially. Uh, uh, yet have to share um, in the negative impacts. <clears throat> so the difference between those two populations was very small when it came to how they rated their life satisfaction, um, but there was a significant difference in stress uh, with your economic uh, beneficiaries um, reporting lower stress than your non-economic uh, beneficiaries, and I'll, I'll show you a multiple regression model in just a second uh, that explains some of that difference. Um, obviously, uh, there was a question in there about how the uh, development impacted personal finance uh, and uh, economic beneficiaries uh, answered it, uh, that it, it helped them, uh, which is a relief to the people who designed the survey. Uh, and uh, impact on traffic, so if we think, if you can see the scale at the bottom, it was a 1 to 5 Likert scale, and so uh, these people that are saying uh, the impact on the traffic is, is just about somewhat worse. Uh, concern about water is worse as a result of development is worse. Cost of housing was by far uh, the most negatively perceived impact um, on these uh, these residents. <clears throat> so looking, digging a little bit deeper into the perceived uh, stress, um, this is the, the Cohen et al.'s uh, perceived stress scale with the 10 items. Um, what we found when we ran uh, the regression Using all, you try to use a whole bunch of variables as, as you know, statisticians do, and then what happens is uh, we found out that these were really the only ones that were significant in predicting uh, stress. And the first one was really interesting. Uh, this there was a question in the survey about the impact on a sense of belonging to the community, uh, and I was really surprised, quite surprised, to find both how strong and statistically significant. Uh, this particular uh, item was in relation to what we thought would be uh, some of the more important ones like traffic congestion. And so you think, you know, people are uh, delayed in getting to work, There's, they, they consider the, the roads dangerous and all this kind of stuff would be very, very stressful. And while it might be on a sort of a, a momentary basis, the long-term stress seems to have to do with these things uh, that are related to identity, a sense of belonging in your community, uh, and so on and so forth which uh, got me uh, and the psychologist uh, thinking a little bit about the idea of cognitive dissonance. Um, and these two quotes, I think, sort of sum that up uh, well. Uh, this first person uh, in a survey, they were in the survey, they were allowed to enter comments uh, at the end. And this one person wrote, things are better for me, but I, I do feel bad about those who don't benefit and su suffer the consequences. And so there's a, a bit of cognitive dissonance going on. And I think in the second quote, uh, what you're seeing is an attempt to assuage that cognitive dissonance by um, just saying, you know, that's, that's the way progress is. It has its, its winners and uh, losers. Obviously, cognitive dissonance is a source of stress uh, in this population. And <clears throat> we're interested in this idea that um, you can reduce the dissonance by sort of uh, attaching onto a, a, a cultural narrative. Uh, and a lot of people who benefited economically indicated uh, that their inconvenience and the inconvenience to other people served a greater good. Which brings us uh, to the um, content analysis of the, of the industry themes uh, and this idea that uh, we, we looked at um, television commercials, uh, newspaper ads, uh, and all of these different types of, of media and 
put together a sort of a narrative that, that the industry is, is putting out there that America needs energy and jobs. Uh, the industry can safely and responsibly develop Marcellus gas while also building stronger communities and making America energy independent. There was a lot of patriotism uh, in all of these different uh, messages and th this idea that opposing shale gas development is somehow un-American. Uh, and in addition to creating a narrative, uh, they are very actively framing the discourse uh, along the lines of what the linguist uh, George Lakoff would call discourse framing. Uh, and uh, this is a really good example. This is from the Energy from Shale a website. Uh, and they say flat out, fracking, uh, fracking has emerged as a contentious issue in many communities. And it is important to note that there are only two sides to the bait. Uh, those who want our oil and natural resources developed in a safe and responsible way and those who don't want our oil and natural gas resources developed at all. So for those of us uh, who have worked out in these communities, uh, you know uh, how its opinions are highly uh, polarized. Um, and even if someone is uh, not necessarily opposed to gas development, if they ask questions uh, or want clarifications, they're quite often, especially in something like a public uh, meeting, uh, stigmatized as, as uh, anti-fracking. Uh, and so there's this idea that there doesn't seem to be any social gray area. You're either for this or, or you're against it. Uh, and we also uh, had documented this idea that there are, are, are large uh, income disparities, both between those people who uh, experience no economic benefit, those who do, but also amongst those who um, experience economic benefits, uh, that can be highly variable. Uh, so you might have been one of the first people who signed a lease for $25 an acre and somebody who held out um, or, or was just more savvy might have signed a lease for $5,000 an acre. Uh, and so your difference in um, leasing payments can range anywhere from $25,000 to $500,000. Uh, and so that has created an awful lot of uh, social conflict uh, within these communities. And of course, this is this is quite variable across uh, all of the different communities. But one of the points I want to make is that local leadership uh, can either make this uh, better or worse, uh, this social con uh, conflict. So we also documented in the focus groups uh, and uh, interviews this idea of, of people um, feeling that they lost control. Uh, and saying things like this was an invasion, the landmen came in here like they own the place and then the workers and trucks uh, and so on. They feel like they've lost control of their own property um, and they've lost uh, control at the local government level. Uh, and this idea that uh, out-of-state uh, gas workers are sort of taking over uh, the place uh, as Angela alluded to um, in her talk. Uh, unpredictable unpredictable uh, commute times is just an example of, of a loss of control um, over your personal life. People felt they weren't getting enough information from the gas companies who were working on their property and uh, there's, that's uh, something that's been documented by a lot of other researchers. Um, and again, uh, informal or institutional local leadership can either make these things uh, worse or better. Uh, we also, um, in talking to people, uh, we're interested in how people respond to the stress, what they do, uh, and uh, we get a sort of a gradient from self-destructive uh, behaviors to more positive behaviors. Uh, and what I like to think about from a policy perspective is how could we promote uh, the things at the bottom of the list uh, that are more uh, proactive, like sharing information, uh, political engagement, promoting local control. So these are things that people actually said we said, you know, we asked them in focus groups or interviews, so how do you deal with all the controversy? Um, they would say things like, well, I try to share information with uh, as many of my neighbors. Uh, I became involved in a, uh, an activist group, or I, became I started attending um, local planning and zoning uh, and ordinance hearings, and so, much, and so on and so forth. And so this idea that they responded uh, in more proactive ways. So in conclusion, uh, as far as the research is concerned, uh, I think that the psychological impacts can vary greatly <laughs> uh, between those who benefit economically and those who don't. Um, and <clears throat> the, I think the development, uh, the effects of development can be improved uh, through public policy. Uh, and just some real quick ideas, um, and I have some from the other speakers 
uh, in just a minute, uh, the idea of a minimum lease price. And if we can put a, uh, a minimum price on a royalty of 2.5%, uh, we could do minimum lease prices per acre too. Uh, so everybody sort of starts off at a level playing field. Um, mandatory local zoning and ordinances uh, that actually engage the residents in the in the process of crafting those uh, zoning and ordinances would help to promote a sort of sense of social control or self-control uh, over um, the process itself. Everybody, I think, uh, would, would agree that we need more dis uh, disclosure about water contamination. So we get away from this issue of not really knowing if your water is going to be uh, contaminated or not, uh, which actually creates, I think, a lot more stress than knowing uh, even if you know your water is contaminated. So those are just some ideas. <clears throat> now I'd like to uh, uh, switch over and talk just a little bit about uh, public policy in general and then uh, as it relates to uh, unconventional gas uh, development uh, in particular. I should point out that uh, I, uh, I asked the other presenters to send me um, some some thoughts and ideas and so you'll see them, them uh, peppered uh, throughout uh, this discussion. Um, and one of our problems in policy in general, I, I believe, is that everything is very uh, much based on cost-benefit analyses, actuarial risk uh, assessments, and so on and so forth. Um, and we've sort of depersonalized all of these statistics uh, and lost focus on actual well-being of individual people. Uh, and unfortunately, that's, uh, that's just the nature of the game. Uh, the good news is that I think you know a lot of uh, serious uh, policy people uh, are starting to move away from some of these measures like GDP, gross domestic product, and looking at uh, well-being. Uh, and a lot of this is driven by the United Nations Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which actually uh, uh, includes well-being as an ecosystem service. Uh, that should be measured and so I think we're seeing at different policy scales a growing interest in well-being uh, and the economists who you saw on the first slide have told me that uh, this idea of measuring well-being is becoming very very important and popular uh, in economics uh, and so I think we are starting to see a bit of a shift which is um, encouraging. The other thing I'd like to point out is that uh, different types of data are often effective uh, at different policy levels when we look at uh, what type of research uh, is used or consumed by local, state, uh, and national um, uh, entities. And so at a national scale, uh, I, I believe things become more and more depersonalized. And so uh, the one economist, uh, Alberto, that you saw on the first slide, uh, is always thinking in terms of total energy output uh, on a national scale, how many jobs were created, not really uh, looking at uh, who, you know, who the jobs are, uh, went to or whether they're good jobs or, or not, uh, but it's just these sort of numbers of how many jobs were created. Uh, and uh, clinical studies and so on um, do filter up, uh, but I'll talk about that process in, in just a second, but mostly uh, national policy decisions are being made um, at some of these uh, different types of quantitative um, analyses. States uh, are, will be a lot more focused on uh, revenue, job creation, uh, but definitely more sensitive to individual uh, health data. And I think uh, New York and, uh, and uh, Governor Cuomo's um, decision not to allow um, shale gas development uh, in New York State is a very, very good example of this. Uh, and um, once we get down to local uh, policies and uh, like a, a local zoning board drafting ordinances, um, clinical work, local stories, uh, and case studies become extremely relevant um, because we're, you know, p people are talking about their neighbors uh, in these rooms. <clears throat> so I just wanted to throw out this idea that some of us have the potential to influence national policy but most of us might have the greatest the potential to influence state and uh, even local policies, which I, I think are, are sort of underappreciated. Uh, and so when my colleague and I were participating in these um, permitting hearings uh, in this township, uh, it became obvious that uh, the people, um, including the, the township supervisors and, and the residents, were just desperate for any kind of expertise. Uh, and it, 
the only people that were showing up to these hearings with expertise were from the industry. Uh, and so this is a place where we could really influence uh, policy by becoming more involved. Okay, so what are some of the mechanisms uh, by which policy uh, is created? And I think mostly when we think of policy, we think of uh, legislation, the Clean Air Act, National Environmental Policy Act, and uh, so on and so forth. So how can we as researchers influence that uh, legislative process? Um, one is to lobby elected officials, um, but I think most of us would, would agree that that's, uh, we wouldn't be very effective at it, um, partially because of campaign finance uh, corruption, for lack of a, any other way to put it, uh, but also because uh, we really don't have the time or, or even the skills uh, to be meeting with elected officials, although <clears throat> some of us do, not all of us. Uh, so what is helpful quite often is to partner with a, an organization uh, like the Center for Environmental Health, or um, in my case, I'm working with Natural Resource Defense Council, um, who are people who have lawyers and everything who, who are, are trained uh, to craft legislation uh, and so on and so forth. And in this uh, particular case, um, I teamed up with somebody from NRDC on another project. It's, it's actually not fracking. Uh, and um, they were interested in uh, writing some legislation and have it uh, introduced uh, by uh, representatives, um, U.S. representatives, uh, and they wanted to know how people in the general population might react um, to this uh, new uh, plan that they had. Uh, and so they asked, as I was developing a survey, if I would put some questions um, in my survey about uh, their plan, and of course I did that. Uh, and so the idea here is that it's a partnership in which I'm not just trying to influence policy, but I'm actually working with these people who are writing legislation to develop research questions. Uh, and so there's a sense of ownership um, that they're interested in. Um, <clears throat> so uh, some, some other uh, ideas uh, in addition to a, a minimum lease price, which is something that would have to be uh, legislated. Uh, Simona Perry uh, had a, a recommendation to require all oil and gas corporations and their subsidiaries and contractors uh, conducting unconventional oil and gas exploration um, to carry full environmental and medical liability insurance uh, equal to 10% of the corporation's total assets. Now that's the type of thing that would have to be uh, implemented through legislation uh, and so um, that's uh, just a, I think a, a good example of that. <clears throat> So when we think about the type of data um, that are, are, are helpful here, uh, clearly um, if you're trying to lobby an elected official in their office, they're going to be extremely sensitive to case studies, clinical studies, and so on and so forth. But once they leave that room and they try to persuade uh, their peers um, to think about this piece of legislation, the discourse very quickly turns uh, back to uh, cost benefit, economics, actuarial risk, uh, and so on and so forth, because these are the uh, th those these are the currencies of political negotiation. And so that's just something uh, that we have to keep in mind. Uh, the second way uh, policy is is uh, um, uh, made is through litigation and court decisions. And I think you know a, a lot of people uh, who have followed the Robinson Township versus Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Supreme Court case uh, can appreciate this. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, not only striking down uh, sections of Act 13, uh, which would take local power, uh, local power uh, for zoning uh, the in, for the gas industry away from local entities, uh, was struck down by the Supreme Court, and in particular, uh, they cited uh, Article 1, Section 27 of the Pennsylvania Constitution, uh, which is a, a, a clause that says all residents of Pennsylvania are entitled to a clean environment. Uh, and so this is uh, an example of how policy is actually made uh, by court decisions. That's going to be very um, influen influential. So how do we influence uh, those processes? Again, it's partnering uh, with people uh, like uh, the Center for Coalfield Justice down in the Southwest, the Responsible Drilling Alliance up north, uh, the Delaware Riverkeeper uh, par uh, partnered with a lawyer to actually affect that Robertson decision. Uh, and uh, so the type of data uh, that is used here is quite highly personalized, personalized case studies, testimonies, uh, clinical studies, because these are essentially moral arguments uh, that are being made in the case of litigation and court decisions. 
Um, the third is uh, executive decree, uh, is, a, is um, a mechanism for creating policy. Uh, and of course, the uh, governor of New York um, uh, turning the moratorium on gas development into a full ban is an example of executive uh, decree. Uh, and so <clears throat> here's something, uh, I, at least uh, um, two of the speakers in this webinar uh, were talking about health impact assessments. Uh, and uh, Dr. Durska uh, actually uh, suggested that um, uh, the New York, uh, well, she had said that last year the New York State Assembly passed a bill that would have required health impact assessments uh, for fracking. This is also the type of thing uh, that could be done uh, by executive uh, decree. Uh, and health impact assessments, just to remind everybody, are, the, are these uh, to assessment tools that involve uh, multiple stakeholders in uh, actually defining the research questions uh, and then making decisions about uh, whether to move forward. So I do want to take, I, I know I only have a few minutes left, uh, but I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about um, organizational implementation because for a lot of us, uh, I think this is this is a, a, a very underappreciated form of policy um, creation. And this idea that once you have legislation, you have court decisions, you have executive decrees, that it's actually organizations who have to implement those policies, and they have their own cultures uh, and uh, practices that are based on past rewards and punishments uh, that often make them uh, very resistant to new types of analyses. And so that's why I think. Uh, it's very important to partner with somebody within those organizations uh, to develop research. Uh, and for example, uh, if we look at something like the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, uh, most people would sort of gravitate towards uh, the secretary as being the person who sets policy, and to a certain extent that's true. But it's the career uh, people within that organization just below him who are actually the ones who are mostly responsible for implementing policy, Unmuted. creating changes within the organization. And those are the types of people that are very open uh, to partnering and possibly changing the culture of the organization that uh, they're working with. Uh, and so, for example, I'm working uh, with some people out in the state of Illinois um, who are more of these uh, long-term career people rather than focusing on um, the political appointments. And then finally, I'd already mentioned a few examples of uh, the local level um, actually participating uh, in drafting of local uh, ordinances and at the county level working with uh, county planners, for example, is a way that we could really, really impact uh, policy using our, our research. So those are just some ideas, uh, and I was hoping that they would you know, stimulate some questions uh, for the other uh, speakers, and on that note, I will uh, turn it back over to Ellen. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was a really great presentation, and it was great to hear about the research that you're doing. Um, and also, you know, thank you for that really nice overview on the different mechanisms that are involved in implementing public policy. Um, so we'll now uh, get started. Um, with some questions. There's some questions coming in, so please feel free to continue to type in your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll try to get to those. Um, so the first question, um, I'm going to unmute the other speakers here. Okay. So the first question here um, is for Lydia, and the question is... And actually, a few questions came in. Really, are they're very uh, similar. It's all sort of following the same theme, which is um, talking about the sense of control and was the sense of control correlated um, with well density or distance to wells and homes? Um, you know, the person asked, could there be a relationship between the type of um, uh, industry activity and well pad and compressor station? Um, and pipeline and feeling of control. So I'll go ahead and stop there and let you answer. Okay, so the short answer is yes, there could be. The difficulty with the sample in the study is that there was virtually no variation in terms of all of our, basically all of our participants lived very close to wells. So in order to see an association 
between proximity density of wells and an outcome, we needed to have we need to have people who vary on how close they are to wells, and we didn't have that in our sample. So we actually cannot answer that question. We would need additional participants who lived farther from wells than the sample that we have. Frustrating, I know. So that would be something that would be interesting to, to study possibly at some point. Yeah, that's that's one of the one of the limitations of this sample in terms of of understanding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's going on is that we didn't everyone lived close to wells and other industrial activities, so we can't look at at proximity and density. Okay, got it. Great, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna have another question here. Um, and this question is for Angela. Um, Angela, did you have trouble at all accessing the mobile workers and what type of responses um, did you get within the oil and gas industry to your to your research and consultation? Did you get pushback or mm -hmm. were people welcome? Actually, yeah, that's a question I often get. And um, surprisingly, I was welcome. And surprisingly, you know, um, I, I interviewed, um, you know, men, male mobile workers specifically, and they were very open and um, very willing to sit down and share one to two to three hours with me and tell me about their experiences. And are you, um, you mentioned another question that came in is about the, the assessment tool that you, can you um, like go over that a little bit again and how that works? Sure. Yeah. No, I sort of just breathe. Uh, through that part, um, partly due to timing, but um, so the mobile worker well-being assessment tool is a tool born out of, um, you know, our experience in health impact assessments um, and, you know, my research looking at mobile workers and, and knowing that mobile workers and mobile work camps um, fall outside the fence in impact assessments, so really wanting to bring them, you know, within the assessment itself. So the tool is... Um, really based on um, what's called the human performance model. And, and that involves um, two parts. Um, so the human performance model is, is used for elite athletes and people training um, for athletic events. And, and it involves um, two things, getting the player ready, so getting that athlete ready, and game time. And, and we, sort of, we sort of use that as a model for mobile workers. And we see that at present, industry excels at game time meaning they provide um, with their health and safety programs the necessary rules, policies, procedures, personal protective equipment, and all of that. Um, however, what is less addressed is getting the player ready. So this, um, this component largely is comprised of that other 12 hours. So when workers get off shift, when the worker or player is not at work, but within the camp environment, um, whether they be resting, eating, socializing, or the next workday. Um, we really need to focus on the other 12 hours and how to um, best uh, design camps and camp spaces so that workers, um, you know, their mental well-being is taken care of, they feel rested, they're able to engage in activities that, you know, blow off steam or bring them enjoyment or enrich their lives um, so that, you know, the workers living within these spaces are not so, um, you know, struggle, struggling with uh, you know, with, with the work camp spaces, with um, lack of social connection, um, you know, just with a, with a lack of the ability to, to lead balanced lives. So the Mobile Worker Wellbeing Assessment Tool um, is uh, a very systematic tool that looks at um, specific areas within the camp and um, based on um, uh, the, the sort of um, guidance documents and um, you know, the best practices within work camps. We sort of measure um, each specific camp space against those documents, as well as, you know, leave room for, for new ideas for improvement. So um, it's, it is comprised of uh, different areas of camps that we look at and different rating tools and, um, you know, at the end of the day, recommendations on how to pr improve specific camp spaces. So it's, it's really bringing in, um, the mental welfare of workers, really bringing that to, to the center of things, 
um, because I think health and safety is, is often stressed, but the, the mental well-being of workers is, is somewhere lost. Great, thank you. And then another question that came in for you, Angela, is um, have you thought of taking um, the same work that you've been doing in Canada around oil, uh, oil uh, um, extraction, production, and, 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 you know, use that also maybe in a different scenario and, and see what you find in a different environment? Um, so, sorry, what, uh, like different environment as in... Um... So, like a different location, right? So, most of the research, I believe, I think this mm -hmm. person was thinking, most of the research you've done has been in Canada specifically, right? Oh, oh absolutely. Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, um, I, I get a lot of inquiries into my research, um, mainly because not a lot of people have looked at the lived experience of mobile work camps. And, you know, while this is um, research that's based in northeastern Alberta, Canada, definitely. I think um, a, lot more, a lot more research and investigation needs to be done um, in different locales across Canada, across the U.S., and overseas. Um, so... Certainly, there's um, there's a lot more research to be done, and uh, I think a lot more, um, you know, specific insights, unique insights within different camp spaces, different, you know, even industrial sectors. I think there's a lot, um, you know, to investigate and to learn. Great. Um, you know, having said that, I have, um, you know, done health impact assessments in different um, parts of Canada and the U.S., so, you know, there are... Um, strong uh, themes emerging across them, um, which, you know, I've, I've highlighted within my presentation. But again, the, the research um, out there in mobile work camps, um, on mobile work camps, is quite scarce right now. So hopefully this, uh, you know, this presentation and, and um, my ideas can open up the door for, for more and more research. Great. And then I have a question here for David. David, the question is, um, can you, when, when will your study, um, the results from your study be available? David, are you there? I'm sorry, I had my mute on. Oh, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> In a... Um, um, in peer-reviewed format, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell. Uh, we're just start, uh, starting to go through the quantitative um, analysis now, um, but with the actual uh, sort of white paper status, uh, we're hoping within a, a month or two that we'll, we'll, we'll have some uh, information that we could distribute. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to work in a team with 11 people, but it, it does slow things down a little bit. I'll, I'll say that much. Mm -hmm. I also I, I'd like to respond to an earlier question um, that was uh, for Lydia about the well density, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I should point out that in our study that's that's one of the things we did. We actually constructed a, a stratified sample so that we would capture a high variability in when, uh, in the well density, and we're just in the process now of, um, of of analyzing those data and trying to find those spatial correlations. Some really crude preliminary correlations that we ran uh, showed that there was less of an effect than we thought there might be, uh, with the exception of the people who benefited economically from the development through leasing their land tend to actually uh, say they benefit more uh, because uh, the more wells that are around them, the, probably the more revenue they're getting. So people in denser areas are actually getting more royalties uh, and lease payments. So that's uh, kind of the, the, pro the, the point there. Um, but as far as the negative effects, like the noise, the traffic, and all that kind of stuff, um, I think what we need to be looking at, and, and we will be trying to add in addition to wells, compressor stations, uh, traffic routes, and all this kind of stuff, because you could actually be in a place that doesn't have a lot of wells right near you, but you've got all the traffic and you've got the compressor station. So I think that uh, uh, well density uh, might not be as an important uh, a variable as actually looking at all the different uh, parts of the of the uh, the industrial uh, infrastructure, uh, which kind of uh, gets uh, to this point that you know most of those things are are sort of regulated by different entities, and so you've got FERC on pipelines, um, you've got DEP on compressor stations, you've got some local uh, um, zoning commission, or perhaps nobody at the local level, you know, thinking about where all the trucks are going to go and the traffic and so on. 
Uh, and so it's this idea that the policy landscape is extremely fragmented, uh, which tends to, I think, lead to more um, psychological stress. Thank you for that. That's a good explanation. So we have another question here. Um, I believe it's for Lydia. The question is, how amenable do you find clinical practitioners to talking about environment and its effects with their patients? That's a really good question. Um, I think that it is variable. I think that as David has pointed out, um, there are people who benefit from this activity and people who don't, and their experience is then different. Um, I live in California, and the nurses here, I would say, nurses and, and healthcare providers in general, are very amenable to um, becoming engaged in a dialogue about the environment. Um, I believe that in Pennsylvania that we also ha are developing strong collaborations with healthcare providers um, in terms of educating nurses and physicians about the relationship between health and the environment. Great, thank you. And here's another question. Um, these are questions, I think, um, again, probably for Lydia, um, is where and how can we ex access the healthcare provider guide handout? And I think they're probably talking about the um, the handout in the resource directory that, that Jessa was referring to last week. Um, and I believe the answer is um, it's on the, the Southwest Pennsylvania um, Environmental Health Project website. Um, and Lydia, is that correct? Actually, um, right now, at this moment in time, our website is currently under construction at EHP. Okay. But I could, Ellen, if, if you're amenable to this, I could send a copy of this document to you, and you could push it out to the participants. It's designed for primary care providers and mental health care providers for both of them and it reviews the what is known from industrial accidents, petroleum-related industrial accidents about mental health, as well as what is a review of the research that's been done to date on mental health and unconventional natural gas. So I'd be happy to make sure that you have a copy of it, Ellen. Yeah, absolutely. We'd be, ha we'd be happy to help share that and push that out. Great. And then another question here, which um, follows in line with that, is just generally broadly is, what, uh, what, what kind of opportunities are out there generally to educate primary care providers and other health professionals? I know, you know, we, we at CEH have, have started to engage in this process a little bit, but, you know, Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project has been involved in this for a while, and it'd be great to hear um, some thoughts from you, Lydia, and, and others if they have about that. I lost a little bit of what you said there, Alan, but I can um, tell you again, and we could also push this out if you would be willing to help us with this. Um, in June, we are having a healthcare provider workshop, um, a conference, day-long event that um, promises to be incredibly informative and actually has generated already, um, we have quite a bit of interest from healthcare providers regionally and nationally in the event. Um, EHP also has a toolkit for um, primary care providers. Um, and there are various organizations as well. The um, Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments also provides educational opportunities for nurses and other health care providers um, on topics related to this arena. Great. Thank you. Okay. And then um, the final, um, you know, there's, there's a couple questions have come in. Um, one about... Uh, you know, like next steps. So what, what can we do with the information that we've been presenting in these webinars? How can we make this information uh, more useful for the audience and for others? Um, one, well, we will have recordings. So the recordings will be up on our website at some point. Um, and I will alert everyone, um, everyone that, that's been on our email, on distribution lists, um, 
uh, and attendees and, and registrants, we will be notifying you when those recordings are available. And then just more generally, um, I think I would like to explore um, uh, with with uh, the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project more offline, but also um, with some of the other speakers as well offline, maybe the possibility of compiling and putting together some of the key findings that have come up in these webinars um, and put it, put it into some kind of summary document. Maybe we can even um, bring together some of the policy recommendations um, and build on that and, and we can maybe use that and share that. It'll be more of a general document, but maybe people will find that useful. So um, if people are willing, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll reach out to everyone and uh, all the participants and and we can we can get going on that and try to try to put something together um again i want to thank everyone um all the speakers um today's session and prior sessions and all the attendees um for participating in the, in the series it's really been great um to you know the speakers we really appreciate you sharing the work that you're doing the research you're doing um your observations and insights and um it's really uh you know, as disheartening it is to, you know, having these, having these impacts um, in communities, you know, be taking place. I think it really is uh, good to hear and, uh, you know, reassuring to hear that people are working to, to address this issue. So thank you all. Um, and to all the attendees, thank you for attending. And please, we'll, we'll be sure to keep people updated as we, for, you know, future webinar sessions and events that we do. So we hope to, to see you again. All right. Thanks all. And uh, we'll sign off. Take care.